Greetings and salutations, travelers. Welcome back to the Inn of Planar Crossroads. And as always, welcome back to our Around the Hearth discussions. This time, we are discussing magical power creep. Which, it sounds like there's some kind of magical, powerful creep that's after you. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to get, a, what picture I'm going to get in the thumbnail for this one. <laughs> uh, it's throwing me off a little bit. And I'm the one that chose the name, so... Uh. I mean, that's pretty solid for a BBEG fantastical... Candy. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Magic power creep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, that thought established and taken care of, let's go ahead and get into introductions so we can get into our shout-out, so we can get into the chat. So, I'll go first, and then it should be... Scrap this time, I think. Oh no! I think it's scrap this time. You every time, so I'm not gonna say it. No, no, I haven't picked him every time. <laughs> every time. It just feels like every time. Mm. It's every time, even when it's not. So. <laughs> All, All right. right. So well. it'll be it'll be me and then Scrat and then Dan. So good. Um, as far as. The Inner Planar Crossroads. We're coming to the end of February. So, um, the Art and Apologetic streams, I was, I'm was i hoping to start them up in in Ju June, blah, 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 in Ju January, but it may be February. It will depend. I'm pretty confident I can get at least one in for the Gentle Voice TV which is the ministry channel that I'm doing. So if you want to check that out, you can. That'll be on Rumble, though. We're streaming that on Rumble. I'm going to try that out because we will be next month, since this is coming out in February, we will be next month shifting our house specials, which is what we do for our live streaming of the art I make and going through the different creative processes that I do for creating tabletop stuff that's going to be shifted over to to Rumble and then later reposted onto YouTube uh, because Rumble seems to be better for just live things in general right now probably due to saturation in YouTube I'm not sure but probably that mm. so we're going to be shifting that over there and I've already mentioned you're watching on the Interplanar Crossroads, so I may as well tell you that if you want to support the things that we're doing here at the Interplanar Crossroads, that this content is cr is created and supported by mem uh, by travelers and viewers like you. So thank you. That's an honor. For those of you that don't stick around for the outro, that's what the outro says. If you don't want to know, well, fine then. But you can check out our social links on theiopc.com or the Interplanar Cro in of Planar Crossroads dot com. Either one of those URLs work to find us on the social medias or on our upload uh, channels. That's me. Now we're to Scrat. Mm -hmm. I am Scrat from a Squirrel Plays over on YouTube where I make videos talking about mechanics of storytelling, things like creating characters, doing some world building. Uh, lots of world building over there. But I also talk about the mechanics of TTRPGs, both in the storytelling sense and also actual gameplay mechanics. And I have lately been exploring new TT, new to me TTRPGs and just trying to get others stirred up with new ideas and inspiration. Trying to get them to share their good works instead of keeping them all to themselves. Dang. That's it. All right. What you got, Dan? Dan from Avenue Studios. You can check us out. AvenueStudios.media is our website. It has links to everything. We are on YouTube, Rumble, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. We do live plays of TTRPGs, and uh, we're starting to do some more reviews. And we have some new shows coming out starting hopefully in March. If all goes well. Uh, a little bit more on the entertainment side. Some more entertainment shows. Still in the RPG realm, though. Uh, very fantastical. So good to shout out in February. And of course, we are, by the time this video is coming out, we are beginning the story mode of our West March campaign through the Kingmaker uh, Pathfinder module using second edition rules in Founding Virtual Tabletop that is exclusive to supporters of our channel. Uh, so it's going to be really great. 
check it out. Come play with people from all over the world in our Discord and uh, conquer the stolen lands with us. So hopefully there will be some video content coming out on that, and we are going to be doing some live streams. We live stream on Rumble, and then it gets uploaded to YouTube later uh, of reviews of some games we got at the latest convention we went to. So check out Philadelphia Area, Area Gaming Expo. Really great. Hope I can see you there next January. I'll be running games there, and hopefully be on some panels too. So hope to see you there. Oh, I'll shout out too. I didn't do it. Till now, Ecclesicon with DM Tales. Wes is running his first convention out in the Jersey area. Um, Ecclesicon.com, I think, is the website. And you can see Jacob and I will be running some games up there. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. We'll try to make some video content and post that. That's in April. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think when we roll around into March, since this is coming out... Uh, when we roll around into March, we're going to try to have him here for that chat so he can shout that out and be, Ecclesicon can be our Levi shout out. So yeah. we'll see. Awesome. Lord willing, that'll I'm work excited. out. Yeah. It's probably going to be a nice, a small convention. Nice. It's his first try. Um, and it's some of the ticket sales go to some charities too. So I'm, I'm really excited for it. Yeah. And speaking of Levi's shout out since our announcements are done we have a suggestion by Scrat for Old Grognard Says on YouTube so you can check him out on YouTube he has some different things got Star D6 Star Wars AD&D Spelljammer uh, how weapon specialization works in AD&D too so you can check that out. He has a regular upload schedule, which is just nice to see. And he's currently at 1,170 subscribers. So we're we're trying to get him up to 12. But if you want to push him up to 2,000 to sneak him past Scrat, who suggested no, no, him, no, no. then you can't. So I'm just throwing that out there, you know. But that's that. Or even better, get them both over 2,000. There you go. Me first, though. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I didn't, I didn't specify. So that's true. Yeah. It was a soft recommendation. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> okay. So my belabored pun aside, check out old Grognard says, and... That means we're done with our Levi's Spotlight, which it's a scratch spotlight technically this time, but it's Levi's Spotlight for the title, so because, you know, we like Levi, so... Tradition. Tradition. <laughs> um, means we're done with our announcements. We're done with our shout-out. It's time to grab our preferred beverage and join us around the hearth as we discuss magical power creep skull oh, oh yeah paladin squirrel all right the very fact that we're talking about magical power creep and the first thing you thought of was a paladin it not exactly wrong <laughs> <laughs> But I do like the glyph designs and some of these effects that I'm seeing. The, yeah, those have been really neat. My problem is that if I was to bother thinking about that, I'd be like, those glyphs don't make sense. Oh, yeah. For sure. Because that's that's a AI, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they can't, no. they can't, they can't spell. <laughs> so. That's why it's kind of a rabbity looking head, too. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, we have our overpowered squirrel right there. Before we get into our general discussion, though, we always like to do key points and considerations. So, I have several things to list this time because this can be something that people face in their games even players who aren't trying to this can happen to so let's go ahead and do for definition's sake what we're talking about when we're talking about power creep 
because this came up in our pre-discussion and we wanted to make sure to give it a good definition for y'all watching. The definition that we're using tonight for the power creep or the magical power creep specifically is how the PCs can quickly outdistance the difficulty of the challenges the GM presents. And I worded it that way specifically because it's not just about the combat challenges they're facing. Mm. It's about all the challenges they're facing that this can happen in. Um, some suggestions and key points to think about in the general discussion is that you see this a lot in long series. If you don't play long, uh, several successive games, you're not going to have a creep of anything. It's just going to be the natural progression of a game. But that power creep can get there the more you play into something, the longer you end up playing it. So it's something you'll have to watch in your longer running games. I'm sure that Dan will be able to attest to that in the open legend game that I'm hoping he brings up that they have on their channel. Uh, play monsters smartly and accurately. That's a way you can help deal with this. The Which is a, just a general good thing to do. You can give creatures class levels, lives, and stories to change the way your players think about and feel when they being so much more powerful, perhaps, march into this area and then start wasting all these all these goblins or whatever. Uh, incorporate consequences for the PC's actions and decisions outside of things that might directly affect them. Uh, because if they're playing long enough, if you're playing somebody from 1st to 15th level, which is where things start at... At 5th level, you're getting pretty powerful. At 10th level, you are very powerful in a... in the We're using D&D Pathfinder. You know, most systems, 10th level is very strong. And it's something that you should really... You're going to see this by then, most likely. Uh, make magic magical. By that I mean, don't. If you just throw magic stuff at them, it's not precisely their fault that they get so powerful. If you just throw magic items at them to use all the time, so I've said it before and I'll say it again: don't put it on the board if you're not willing to let them have it. Mm. So there's that to think about. And then I will rebring up a point from when we were discussing soft magic systems before creative players in soft systems can break your game faster than a min maxer can in a hard system that's what i say so let's get into general chat then it's gonna happen <laughs> just like what you said it doesn't matter if you're in an open system or a, a real crunchy system. If you play long enough, it's, you're going to run into this. And I wanted to shout out our high-level play discussions with Zek and stuff, because I think a lot of the stuff we talked about there would um, kind of apply when you find yourself there. Mm -hmm. So I think, I don't know, correct me what you guys think about this. <clears throat> the one advantage to the crunchier systems with the power creep is that the, the, generally speaking the power creep is built into the system so there is kind of a limit I think this goes to what you were saying Adam where creative players could break a soft system because there's technically no limit so they can they can stretch it as far as their creativity can go while a min-maxer is restricted at some level to the system now, I'm sure Scrat will have thoughts on 5th edition. <laughs> <laughs> Power creep. Um, so it does depend on the system, but in that case, you do have that, that advantage. Whereas in the soft systems, in the I should say the lighter systems or the more open systems, my biggest advice is, and it's more to the players on behalf of the GMs, is the self-limitation. It's something I love in Open Legend because we talked about alteration in Open Legend. That could break the game. 
part of the design in Open Legend was the assumption that you would be self-limited. And that's something working together as a team, GM, and player. But I, I love that in general for me as a player. I love self-limiting myself, even within a system like 5th edition or Pathfinder. I won't pick certain feats or certain spells because it doesn't fit the character, even though in that system, technically, I have access to that or could have access to it. That is something more specific to me and my play style. I like to do that. <clears throat> Not everybody, more pe some people are interested in, in min-maxing the game. Even in an open system, you can min-max the game in a sense. So, I don't know if you guys... I threw a bunch out there, but if you guys have thoughts on any of that. Right. Well, on wording and stuff like that, you, the longer you play a game, the the higher the level it is, the more you're going to get into wording questions, stuff like that. I just brought up, just so people know that I'm not just being silly when I say that alteration can break a game. Alteration can break things at low levels in in it. At power level 2, shapeshift, the new form cannot be a different size than the target, so you're medium, basically. It must possess similar physiology to the target, humanoid, perhaps. The examples of different physiology include animals, plants, elements, and oozes. So you can't be an animal, a plant, an element, or an ooze. This is just the first power level, mind you. Uh, this is, technically, you have a a two in alteration, which is very easy to get at second at first level. Mm -hmm. This list is not exhaustive. Blah, 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 blah. The target does not gain alternative forms of movement like flight. So there's a limit there. The target does not gain extraordinary attributes of the new form. So they can't do anything like that. Now here's this thing. It's a sustained boon meaning you have to think about it and concentrate. Basically, that's what it means. It requires concentration. That's an easy fix. Also, mm. you, investing in one stat can break the game. That's why it's so important in Open Legend for self-limitation. And that's why it's so important for self-limitation in those soft systems like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Just looking at a purely mechanical example. Because if you get a three, if you have a a three in alteration you can shape shift into a creature between half and double the target's original size now so if you're five feet tall you're now ten feet tall you're now a giant and you gain any form of any non-flight movement modes of the new form do you know what that means you can transform into a giant oni with teleportation abilities because onis have teleportation so you you start to break things really fast in a soft system just by playing it as written. So that's why it's a narrative game. It's about what story you want to tell. This is just to help facilitate the story that the players and GM want to tell together. Mm -hmm. So there's a the purpose of the system is important. And those type of things that I'm talking about could not be done at at the same levels of progression in a hard system. So you couldn't do those things. Right. Yep. So the magical power creep there is about the self-limitation. Now, I'm seeing really powerful stuff happen in the bomb squad thing, but they're level what? They're actually level. Did they get to level nine? They're not. They'll. They're for this next session we're filming. They're at level eight. So what you're watching is level seven right now, out of ten. That's okay. So that's level seven out of ten, and they're getting. Yeah. What was the highest roll so far? Eighty, or something like yeah. that. Eighty yeah. something. And that, and that that's a good point with like something with the more open systems. Well, this is a little more specific to Open Legend because it has exploding dice. Yeah. So that's another factor. Because something like ECG6 wouldn't run into this as much. Um, with yep. exploding dice, the, the challenge levels I have found currently, because they have set challenge levels to give you kind of a guideline, you know, just like D&D um, &D and Pathfinder have their, you know, their recommended 
ways to balance things. And the fact is, with exploding dice, you get to that pretty quick in your max stats, in your best stats. Obviously, there's lesser stats that can't do that, but... So I've found opposed rolls works a lot better for a lot of things. Um, mm-hmm. It does make it more swingy, though, on the downside, because I could roll terrible. <laughs> I mean, the dragon was rolling terrible. Yeah, so it <laughs> happens. I don't know. It's, knowing your system, I think, helps with the power creep. Know the system you're playing with, and, and this is a general thing. Be okay making mistakes, because we all do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just, you know, just have fun with it. It's like, wow, that combat was terrible. <laughs> I should have thought of all these things. Or, mm. I don't know. Well, there's only one way to learn, I guess. <laughs> there's a rule that I see in D in Open Legend, and I te- it's technically been around in the TTRPG community for a long time. It's technically supposed to be in the the other games, but because and this is the fall for the the rules heavy ones, because they say you have to roll for this. It means that sometimes people forget that if you that if something is not if it, if you can only fail on a one kind of thing most rule sets say don't bother rolling mm-hmm. and if you can only succeed on a 20 most rule sets say don't bother rolling because you're you it, it that automatically starts to cut out the swinginess you you just cut out 10% of swing i mean i'm just using rough math there 10% of swing so that's not too bad. If you can succeed without even rolling, and this is something that's definitely going to be in the system that I work on. I didn't start our timer. Is this, uh, oh, we're a little ahead. We have an extra 30 minutes now. <laughs> no, it's not 30 minutes. You don't, get accept, you don't get ahead of yourselves. I got to preach in the morning, probably, if it doesn't get canceled for weather. So I got to preach in the morning. Um, the... If you don't, if you're going to succeed anyway, if, if you only can crit fail or crit succeed, don't bother rolling. And I'll, so, I'll kind of work with this of if your attribute alone will get you what you need, don't bother rolling is what I'll do. Most likely, depending on how I work it. So that's kind of the point on it is don't roll unless you need to. We like to roll dice. I know I know it's a game where we're sitting around a table rolling dice. That's the joke. That's the thing. That's what we say. And it's not precisely wrong. But you don't always have to roll dice. You can talk it out. It's a, also a drama game. So that's one of my that's one of my recommendations for kind of handling that power creep. Stop rolling so much. Because then if you start to make it depend upon the character and not the roles, that can change the dynamic of how someone's playing that character pretty, pretty heavily. If this character, if this, let's take the paladin, since we've got paladin squirrel up there, <laughs> or rabbit squirrel, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> whatever you want it to be, open system. <laughs> <laughs> it's a soft it's a soft species definition. Um there you go. the the paladin rodent it is the paladins people that play paladins for power often don't role play their charisma correctly. <laughs> what happens when you stop asking for roles and say, "Well, what do you say?" instead of da 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 I'm going to roll my charisma. No, I that's fine. What are you what are you gonna say? We know that you're going to succeed and this is something you can borrow from other systems too, if you're playing a more hardcore system, is we already know you're going to get them to do this. We want to know if you're going to get them to do this like you want them to, if they're gonna to want to do it for you, or if they're just gonna do it for you out of your force of personality. Because you don't need to roll to get them to do it. I want you, we want you to tell, I want you to tell me how you're going to get them to do it. And you don't have to make them completely role play it out because some people aren't in that comfort zone of their gaming style, but they should be able to give you a general idea of, well, I would bring this up to them to tell them, Hey, 
this makes more sense to do it this way. But if you're if you're using your charisma in a forceful way, you become a tyrant and not a ben, uh, beneficial, beneficent leader. And so you you make the player start to actually think about how they apply that instead of making them roll. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good. That's a really good point. That that's adding um, what you had mentioned for different consequences to actions. It's almost a flip on success with a twist, mm-hmm. rather than uh, you failed the roll, but you're still gonna get, you're gonna get a success. But this is you succeed, but mm. in what way does it go? It's yeah. interesting. Do they like you afterward or not? Mm. Right. Or is it a begrudging acceptance to do what you say and now they're holding a grudge that could come back to bite you later? That's interesting. Or even a reputation for the whole party. Start to be viewed as Mm -hmm. as tyrants. Well, paladins are... I don't like that that anything can be called a paladin. It's one of my major quibbles for fifth edition. And I'm glad I actually approve of the change that second edition made of Pathfinder when they said it's champion and then a paladin is a subgroup and the law is the lawful good version of a champion. That makes a lot more sense. And then you have a tyrant and then you have this and that. And that makes a lot more sense. You're, you are a champion of this virtue or of this vice type of situation. When you have that, you have a lot of... You have someone, if it's not clearly defined, paladins have oaths, technically, they're mm-hmm. supposed to take. And this, again, gets into that problem that you have with the newer systems like 5e, wanting to be more open and receptive to the idea of no alignment and no this and that. I actually do ad- I advocate for alignment. I think it's a good idea. I think it does help your setting. I don't think it's correct for every setting, because not every setting is going to play a game that needs alignment. And that alignment should be understood more as a cosmic thing, not a, a personal thing. Your alignment is cosmic, not personal. So thinking about it in that way, this deity that this paladin is getting power from, and this can apply to any other class that has to have an alliance, which are usually the most powerful classes. Uh, Aside from wizards, they can get it. They can usually get power without all of the rigmarole of a paladin but a paladin is the is one of the few martial classes that could take on a wizard that aside the power that's being displayed there is given for an exchange of championing this virtue or idea that this deity wants to promote if you stop doing that and like if you stop asking for roles and having them actually say again not necessarily that they have to role play it out but they have to tell you how they're going to reason it out for that exchange if they don't do it the way their god likes if they're behaving in a way that does not reflect well on their deity their deity will have no problem of saying well you you're not doing you're not promoting my virtue of kindness and understanding you're over here forcing them to do it and you can have warnings and premonitions and stuff like that bad dreams to try and warn them about this send prophets to them and seers to them to say your deity is un is not pleased with the way you're behaving type of situation so you don't have to do it right away you you can give them warnings ahead of time but that was just like you have wizards that need components you have paladins that need deities so yeah yeah that's a great point consequences (laughs) 
What are the consequences of these actions? I, I, what was that meme? Uh, I'm taking this action with that and I have no fear of any consequences or something like that. I don't know if I know that one. <laughs> I remember seeing it somewhere. But, you know, some players be like that. I'm curious, uh, Scrap, what... Uh, is there any uh, favorite examples you have of your power creep issues in 5e? Oh, man. <laughs> Not to call you out on the spot. But... Uh, He's like, favorite. I thought we only had 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, right? Um, man, I don't, I don't have a favorite. I just know that the power creep bit them in the butt one time in my first campaign. Um <laughs> They they missed out on an entire quest line and therefore an entire level they didn't get to gain because uh, they they got too far ahead of themselves. They were they were on a boat and there was a a special person on this boat that they were supposed to discover, um, but they were they're on on the boat going to this magical island to do things and the way it was designed to go down was on the boat. And I think they got close to the island, and big sea monster comes out, and they were supposed to fight the monster. But when they were fighting the monster, that special character would cast some magic, and they'd be like, wait, whoa, hold up, that's this other person we've been hearing about and interested in, and that would lead them down a whole quest line. And then, you know, they go on the island, do the regular quest, and then go on that one. So, well, they, they were on the boat, got near the island, sea monster came up, and that one player that I had mentioned before, uh, it's no longer at the table. He decided to use polymorph on this <laughs> sea monster and turned it into a jellyfish. Altering. And it just, it just, you know, floated away. And then they let it go. And then they went to the island, uh, went in this weird castle and did all this stuff. But when they came out, the sea monster was back and destroyed the entire boat and everybody on it. So... That lady died. <laughs> they didn't get that quest line. <laughs> it was funny because, like, the guy was like, "I yeah, I I know I shouldn't do it, but it's what my character would do." You know, when he's talking about the polymorph, I like, "Hey, man, I I'm I'm not mad. Do what you do. <laughs> yeah, whatever you exactly. want to do, man." That's exactly it, though. You get consequences for actions yeah. right? outside yeah. of what happened. <laughs> yeah. It yeah, they didn't, making them less powerful in the in the uh, outline. Yeah, and I don't think they knew it until the end of the campaign. They were, we were just kind of wrapping up, talking about it, and they're like, hey, what about such and such? And I was like, well, you remember that sea monster? <laughs> <laughs> she was on that boat. <laughs> there you go. That's funny. I guess that's a good lead into the uh, idea about the monsters, too. That the monsters... Don't make your monsters faceless. I mean, it's fun sometimes to just slice through some bad guys and stuff like that. And it actually is good for a game setting to have the irredeemable bad things that you can just slay and not worry about it. That's a that's a good thing for a game. Um, for the for the rest of the game. Other creatures need to be thought of as actually living beings inside that that area. Um, when we were talking with Zachariah about the high level play that he was having, uh, wanting to you know bounce some ideas off and stuff, mm -hmm. the idea was put out there that sure these characters, these individual characters, are super powerful now. But everyone around them isn't. And they kind of like these people that are around them. And they want them to be alive the next time they come and see them. I mean, it's it's all well and good to say, you know, we're going to go out and adventure and, you know, not be here to protect the town. Even though we know that the town is about, is, there's, we heard rumors about an attack happening, but there's lots of treasure over here in this castle. What are you going to do? Are you going to protect the town? Are you going to go? Because maybe the town here, if you have a, an experience-based system, which can be useful for this situation, 
they won't get any experience for saving the town because everything's too low level. That is an option in some in some versions of tabletop games. You get a lower level of experience depending on how out leveled you are to that creature. Mm. Um, we see this in video games a lot, but I have seen it in TR- TTRPGs too. Um, if you don't get any experience for it, but the town's gone when you come back, I mean, who are you going to, where are you going to spend your gold? You got all this gold and nowhere to go with it. So that's an option to think about, you know, making the world around them actually respond to that, making the monsters actually NPCs that they might want to deal with when I, I don't know if I have any viewers that actually went and are this far back. Uh, when we were doing our first run through attempt to, to finish it of rise of the rune Lords, they got to Thistletop and they spared one of the goblins. And I was like, okay, I got to give this goblin a reason to talk to them. And I formulated a a backstory and then I built a little bit more on it later. But she was a goblin that could read, which is no, no, no for goblins. But she learned to read. You know, I, I gave her backstory stuff. I gave her things to make her interesting, things to make her different. And she had a pet rat. So she automatically got bonus points as NPC material and stuff like that. So all of that was done in an instant to try and get, okay, why is this goblin going to talk to them if they're the bad guys? Why would it turn on its buddies? Well, it doesn't like its buddies. There's got to be a reason and so on and so forth. But doing that, they then got an, an NPC follower. Now, be careful because they'll start collecting people. They'll start collecting your NPCs like Pokemon if you're not careful. Speaking so, of creep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So be careful about that. But it's a, it's a balance you can play because she she's not super hot. She was not a super strong character. But and one of the players, I think one of the characters, one of the characters, more than one of the characters didn't necessarily like her. But one of the players also was like, this is a goblin. We need to kill it. It's like, <laughs> no, we don't have to kill the goblin. It helped us with find its enemies and it's like how can you re- he, his character was like how can you read and it's like oh, I gave a vague answer but that was something that you know they latched on to and now I, you know you got fodder <laughs> if you need it right? I'm thinking of all the Bob the Goblin memes <laughs> It's final chat tonight, if you guys, if you viewers can't tell. <laughs> They're getting tired, so. <laughs> I'll sing it as final thought time. Is it not? It probably oh, is. Remember. Probably is. So, let's go ahead and do final thoughts, good gentlemen. over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the paladin? It, it must be a paladin. Scrab it. <laughs> Scrab <laughs> So, that means we got a roll. And since y'all don't keep physical dice by you, I'll use my boss dice again. Let's do it. Gravitus fears not the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's Dan, which ah, means perfect. it's Dan Scratton and me. All right. Oh, <laughs> we even wrap this up, man. Yeah. Like we said, it is going to happen in long campaigns. I, I, it's hard not to just echo the consequences. Think outside the box um, when you come to it. There's easy, with some shots and one shots, easy ways to structure the whole game around whatever level you're in. So you're not necessarily going to run into this. However, we joked, kind of true, creative players can break more open systems. So 
self limitations for that is really useful and then unique consequences and thinking outside the box don't just make it uh, rocket launchers shooting at each other max dice really think outside the box whether it's utilizing different abilities within the monsters you have or like Adam was saying give life to these worlds <clears throat> have the monsters run away have them have if it's like some kind of animal monster maybe you can tug at their heartstrings that it's protecting its nest or something you know you can play with different things there let the world be the consequences so self limitations and consequences might be your best tools to uh deal with those creeps mm. <laughs> all right okay is it me yep Thank all you. right so I had a few. I'm just going to try and pick a couple here and hit them real quick. Um, something I realized is that your power creep kills off your diversity. And to put that in a little bit of perspective, um, that's something you will notice very abruptly in higher tier skill level of competitive like first person shooters or whatever just any competitive gaming right mm -hmm. as you move up that skill level uh which characters get picked which weapons get used whatever that just gets absolutely throttled because you figure out like, this is the thing that works this is the thing that works but i feel like it's also the same in ttrpgs um not so much like you know uh golly or is that a zerg ball that they do in competitive mmos you don't you don't see a uh, tabletop players doing things like that but uh i feel like it really limits what you can throw at them that makes sense um i feel like i've made the complaint a couple times in 5e it's like yeah after level three i feel like the only thing that can give them a decent challenge is something strong enough to blow up the entire planet like that's <laughs> about what it feels like <laughs> you know because little things like bandits you know just a group of ruffians like that's nothing to a level three or four right they can just snap their fingers and poof they're dead but if you give your your bandits spells and stuff you can do that but to me it doesn't make sense so i feel like my diversity of enemies to throw at them just starts going out the window very quickly mm. and I said I had a couple, and I already forgot what the other one was. Um, I keep telling them to make notes, and they keep well, saying, like, we've got them. looking at them. Oh, well, I guess. Oh, no, I remember what it was, and he, he actually touched on it a little bit, was uh, in my first campaign, What I because it was my first campaign I ever ran, you know, I was like, okay, I'm the GM. I want to give them cool things like magic items and new abilities. And I saw their abilities, and I was like, I can't give them nothing. Like, they, they have everything covered. They don't even need money. Like, they just, they got mm -hmm. it covered, man. So, after we got a few levels in, what I started doing, I was giving them abilities that had really heavy consequences to them. Mm -hmm. um, like our, our little rat guy that was a, a rogue, he was actually his story was he was a bunch of rats and they had like this special cloak that made him look like one solid rat um, <laughs> but uh, he had some abilities that would utilize that swarm of rats but like he could do I think he had three abilities and the only one I remember is he would spread out all the rats and they would do I forgot how many d4s he rolled but it was a bunch you know it's just <laughs> you throw all you, you had the potential to do a ton of damage but for like the next turn your ac was next to nothing and you received like double damage or something so you were just wide open um that's what i gave him and then that's great the cleric she had a fun story um but her her special item was this shield she got to replace the one she had but it let her when a, a battle started basically she could choose do you want to be offensive or defensive so when she was offensive uh her attack and everything and damage went up 
and her defense went way down. If she wanted to be defensive, you know, defense went way up and attack went way down. But she was stuck in that stance, for lack of better words, through the whole fight. She couldn't just switch, so she had to pick. So things like that. It's like, yeah, it adds some, but it's going to take something away. Because as that, I didn't know what else to do, right? Because if I gave him something, I was like, oh, here's a cool thing that just makes you better. It's like, well, you're already really good. <laughs> so. Yes. That's such a good point with items. Is I love that, especially magic items. It opens up, just like you're saying, it opens up your diversity of stuff. And the consequences are fun, to be honest with mm-hmm. you as a player. They're fun. It's fun to navigate that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, can, can you really call it a consequence in that game when, when you got death saves and all these other ways to come back? So, <laughs> yeah. It's more like an inconvenience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, unless you roll like me with digital dice, then you might <laughs> spell enough death saves. Oh, man. The, the, the rogue I was just telling you about, that poor guy... He has just, he had the terrible roles that entire campaign. And when we started our new one, the trend is continuing. Oh, no. And I I offered him something. It's like, hey, do you want like a plus 15 to your roles? I will give it to you. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. So he's got a weapon now that always rolls with advantage, no matter what. And he still misses half of his attacks. Well, what might be fun to pair off of that? is if he rolls so terribly maybe he maybe he needs something like an item or something like that that actually stores his misfortune so well, that's what i i did try to give him uh dm scotty's basically the karma system but he has this other thing called lucky dice that you can kind of use in other systems i tried to give that to him and he was like no no don't be giving me new mechanics just because i can't roll dice <laughs> <laughs> like okay, I'm trying. Oh, they have the dice. It's not that he can't roll. The dice are evil. <laughs> <laughs> My wife will attest that a dice jail. She literally bought a dice jail, and it seemed to be quite effective on her rolls. <laughs> <laughs> dice are he, sentient. <laughs> he has the worst luck. It's a. It's impressive. Uh, but I actually, I actually think it'd be fun to play a character where each time you missed a roll. You you would get a tick mm. in some kind of category, and eventually you could you store up enough points, like mana. You would store up enough, and then you would bring that misfortune upon someone else that's attacking <laughs> you or something. So playing a misfortune witch or something like that. Yes. But all right. So that's Scrat's final thought. That's great. My final thought is it's pairing off of the idea and it's kind of going towards what Scrat's talking about with the lack of diversity in challenge monsters and creatures is I want to hone in on that closer because when I talk about adding classes and stuff like that to a monster, I'm not talking about a random monster necessarily. I'm talking about the ones that get away. I'm talking about when you're playing them smart, kobolds don't fight to the death. When you're playing them smart, few things fight to the death. Things will surrender. And if you, if it gets around that your players are mercilessly killing those that surrender to them, monster or not, If it's a sentient creature that's surrendering, that's not always going to go over well. People might not, might not want to hire them if they get the merciless tech in their, in their search history or something like that to (laughs) use computer terms and video game stuff. Deities might not look well on that either. No, deities might not look well on the merciless ones. So, the last chat, um, thinking about that and looking at it. And basically creating rivals, creatures that have a personal history with your players, with your players' characters, sometimes with your players, if they're like from a past campaign or something, but creatures and enemies or allies that have personal history with your 
your group or those specific characters can make a big difference on how they end up interacting with them and what the challenges are with them. Let's say that bugbear was the one that got away. All the other things died and it got out of there. Or Hobgoblin might be a better one. The Hobgoblin got away. All the other goblins died. You killed his entire troop. And, and he vowed vengeance on you as he ro- as he was too out of distance to be able to get gotten. But you could hear him yell his oath of vengeance. And so he just goes off. And who knows where? Right? He got away. You didn't get anything from him. And especially if you're not dishing out experience, they're not really going to spend a lot of resources to go get him. Because he's just one random hobgoblin. But that random hobgoblin goes gets a lot of uh, maybe one or two goblins. And he tries to come back and see what's going on with this party that wronged him so. And he's got a class level now because he escaped. He beat a challenge. He escaped. So he has he's gained experience. That's fun. And he follows behind them recruiting those that ev- that they've wronged that they've made enemies with talked he talks and barters with other creatures cuz he's a cre- he's a a demi human himself he can get, go where they can't he can make barter deals with others that they can't the bugbears talk to him they don't talk to the players the goblins talk to him they don't talk to the players he follows them into town and there's this goblin underbelly that's running this that's in the sewers running some th- doing things for the thieves guild well what happens when he's like why are you doing this for the thieves guild you're there's more of you than there are of them all he has to do is plant that one little seed and all of a sudden he could take over the thieves guild with his goblin horde you can do a lot of fun things like that so yep running away is always an option for <laughs> goodies and baddies <laughs> there you go that's a fun point though it's like he got away so he levels up sort of idea mm-hmm. that's fun I like that a lot alright I think we've uh, finished our chat this time yes I think so, so. nailed it not quite. We are over time. But <laughs> um, that aside, we hope you have enjoyed. As far as the comment for this time, um, scrab it. Scrab it. <laughs> scrab it, Paladin. There you go. I like it. <laughs> scrab it, Paladin. So that's the comment for this time. You can always find the In a Planar Crossroads on YouTube, Rumble, or BitChute. You can check us out on the various Facebooks and Instagrams and X birds or whatever's and stuffs like that. All that's found at theiopc.com or in a crossroads.com. And that's how you would get a hold of us. Also, if you want to check out our min- the ministry channel, it is The Gentle Voice TV. And uh, hopefully I'll be putting out some more content. Well, I will have put out some more content by now for that, because this is the end of February's episode. So, there you go. I think that's everything for me. What about you, Dan? Dan from Avenue Studios. Check us out. AvenueStudios.media is our website. Links to everything there. YouTube, Rumble, Podcasts, Locals, and Patreon. You can join our Discord to play Westmarch Kingmaker Pathfinder module with us come take over the stolen lands and build a kingdom and uh i look forward to seeing uh oh i forgot to shout this out i'll shout it out at the very end here hopefully you it. we are doing our final themed monthly collaboration game with scraticus here Scrat. no that's right <laughs> yeah so it hasn't <laughs> happened yet because wibbly wobbly time but uh, hopefully you will have enjoyed that we'll do uh Forest Forge building it. I think Jake's got some plans already. And I'm going to invite some other guests. I haven't decided exactly who yet, but some other YouTube content creators will be with us for this final game. It'll be a special one in fantastical February. So 
hopefully we've seen you there and you if you didn't catch it live on rumble it'll be up on youtube shortly thereafter and on podcast so enjoy mm-hmm. to clarify i'm sure it's not the last game they'll ever post and pl- play and post but i'm <laughs> sure it's, no <laughs> yeah. the you. last in this series for the year that we did <laughs> yes thank you for the clarification all right speaking of Scraticus. Yeah, I ain't got nothing special. Um, I'm just hanging out over on YouTube. And if you want to hang out in the Discord, there's a link for it in every one of my videos. And you can share squirrel memes and squirrel pictures like this one. That was in there somewhat recently. (laughs) That must have been the squirrel that fell out of Dan's tree. Yeah. That's all I have, though. We, uh, <laughs> I try and poke people to share their stuff, but there's a lot of squirrel memes going around, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> His look is like, I know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry at all. I don't, I don't I'm not sorry. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right. Well, with that fat load of memes set up for us, we hope you had a great time watching and uh, that you just basically enjoyed it. So have a great day. God bless and enjoy. Bye. 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 <laughs> this content was made possible by travelers and viewers like you. Thank you. All right, on the last one, gents. So let's see here. Come up here. Okay. The power. The power of the dark side. The force. I'm not very good at Emperor Palpatine. He is a unique voice for sure. The original actor for that. I love him. So good. You want this, don't you? You want this, don't you? I'm not terrible. I could do it. So many people can do it a lot better than me. <laughs> uh, do it. That one's easier because it. it's it's <laughs> it's it's so quick and it's not even work. You don't even have to do it like you're speaking a word. You just do it like right. you're sounding something. Do it. Even the squirrel can do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I'm picturing a squirrel in Palpatine robes saying, <laughs> do it. <laughs> All right. Now we get into the granddaddy chat. Magical power creep. <laughs> you guys got your your notes? Always. Yeah, Dan says, they're in my head, Adam. And then we hmm. cut away to Dan's head. It's like... Yeah. <laughs> it's just the, the hamster wheel cheese. spinning. Yeah. No hamster on it. <laughs> no, it's not a hamster. It's a squirrel, of course. Yeah. <laughs> He's sitting there taking a drink and just spinning it. <laughs> <laughs> Got this. Got this, Chief. Keep him talking. Just let the guy with the beard talk. Just stuff. He'll do, do, do it. <laughs> yep. I just wait for the smart people to talk and uh, <laughs> lab. You hear that scratch? He's calling you smart. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> he's about to learn some things. <laughs> All right. I mean, if I'm the bar, it's not very high. <laughs> All right, y'all ready? Yes, sir. Yee. Room tone. <laughs>